We'll set this up. Good morning, ladies who are not here with us today. Well, we'll zip around the table. My mom is visiting. Wait, where'd she go? Are you there? Okay. There's my mom, Marge, from Colorado. Yay! There's Rebecca. And other mom. Hi. This is Rachel, mom. <laughs> Hi. Okay, we'll put this this way. And mom, I'll make sure it's not on you the whole time because that can feel awkward. Okay. It's not on. We're side, a little tippy. We've had a rough weekend. There we go. <laughs> okay. Everybody good? Yes. We've been chatting. Those of you that aren't here, you, you do miss the 30-minute chat we start with, but um, you never miss out, and we're so glad that you can be on the other end of the screen. So Amen. let's start with prayer. Would you pray for us this morning, Mom? Yes. Okay. Father God, we thank you for being our Father. We're so grateful for your love. We're so grateful for you. We're for gr so grateful for your son, Jesus. And we just thank you for the Holy Spirit that is flowing in our lives today, giving us power on mm -hmm. high. And we just pray that you bless Stacy today as she shares with us and anoint her as you always do. And we pray that you give us ears to hear your truth, mm -hmm. Lord. You are the most wonderful person in the universe. And we thank you that we can know you and serve you. And I love it. I just heard recently from a friend that truth is a person. Mm -hmm. And that's you, Jesus. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 That's awesome. Praise God. I love that. It is. Helen Mary Brown tells her kids that. That's truth is a person. So he said, I am the way, the, the truth, truth, and the life. It's not just a concept. It's right. who he is. Right. That's really cool. I loved it when I heard it. <laughs> well, hopefully um, everyone has gotten to either listen or be here for last week for talking about hunger. And I popped on a couple times this week with little videos about the different kinds of hunger. And we're going to start there because today's topic is strongholds. But hungers and strongholds are really connected. And um, we'll start by reading a scripture that we read last time. And it's in Isaiah 55, um, verses 1 through 3. And this is the Amplified, but I like it. Okay, Isaiah 55, 1 through 3. It says, Wait and listen, everyone who is thirsty, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Yes, come, buy priceless spiritual wine and milk without money and without price. Sim this is in the parentheses. Simply for the self-surrender that accepts the blessing. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your earnings for what does not satisfy? Hearken diligently to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in fatness, the profuseness of spiritual joy. Incline your ear, so give us ears to hear, and come to me. Hear and your soul will revive, and I will make an everlasting covenant or league with you, even the sure mercy promised to David. There is so much good stuff in there, and I want to start out with a couple questions from that. What is this drink and the food that the Lord is referring to? I know you don't all have your Bibles in front of you. He says, come and buy and eat things that you can't get with money. Why do you spend your money on things? Hearken diligently to me truth yeah because it says buy the truth and sell it not mm -hmm. in Proverbs I think it is yeah he himself just like you were saying truth is a person so even in that exact statement you know truth it's him he's like come and fill up on me I can really satisfy you and this covenant there's something he's talking about I will make an everlasting covenant with you this is an everlasting thing come buy something that's not going to fade away we all understand food and drink you know, so he's using something that's very simple that we need daily, and he's referring to himself. And then he tells us, how do we get this kind of food and drink? He says a lot of different, like, um, imperative statements. Come, buy, hearken, incline your ear, listen, wait. That's pretty awesome. These are things that require us to do something, but the promise that's there is not... Uh, it's it, well just that it's a promise it's not like well come and we'll see what we have we'll see if I got anything for you he says come and I promise you I'm going to give you the food that really satisfies you 
And this is kind of the same question. Who do we get it from? From him. And what is it good for? Did you notice of our spirit, soul, and body, which one it mentioned twice in there? Did you hear it? Anybody? Anyone? Anyone? He said, come to me in here and your soul will revive. He says, eat what is good and let your soul delight itself. And that really, that mm-hmm. word is, this is the Hebrew, so the soul is the nefesh, I think. In Greek, it's suke. So it's what we base the word psychology on. So it really is referring to that mind, will, and emotions. He's saying it's good for your soul, for your mind, your will, and your emotions. And then what are we promised, circling back around him, this everlasting covenant? And the end, he says, and I'll make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercy promised to David, these mercies. So um, Mm -hmm. again, that's Isaiah 55, 1 through 3. I would encourage all of us just to meditate on those verses. There's so much in it this week. Um, and come back to that scripture and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. And one of the reasons I think it's so good is because it's really important to know the cure or the remedy to something before you really die. Doing that. Hi, I hope you guys weren't gone for long. I just noticed it had a little note saying the live feed was blocked. But welcome back. <laughs> um, it was only there six minutes, so I think we're good. Um, if you miss the scripture, it's Isaiah 55, 1 through 3. Okay. So picture this like army. This is where they come to and this is where they operate from. This is their strongest place. That's what a stronghold is. That's a good aspect of a stronghold. Mm -hmm. But you can also see if that were a negative place in your life, it's where you operate from. It's where the missiles fly out of. It's where you hide. It's where you keep all the stores of whatever you're trying to keep for yourself. Like we were saying, we had leftovers for a party. We're hoarding all these things up in that stronghold. That's where you keep your valuables. So if our valuables aren't really valuable, if the weapons that we're uh, using are destructive instead of helpful, a stronghold is not a good thing. But to also remember that it can be a good thing because the Lord himself refers to himself as our stronghold in so many places. And I'm going to rattle off a whole bunch of scriptures. You can write them if you want. You can come back and listen because we have got to be filled with the truth, just like everything we're saying. And um, one of the things I've noticed about the enemy, and you probably all know, this, he can't create anything. So all he does is counterfeit, corrupt, and contradict everything that God creates. And that one, you could write it down. It's really good. He counterfeits, corrupts, and contradicts everything that God creates. That is good. He can't create anything. So he takes something God creates, and he creates a counterfeit to it. He turns a a contradiction to it, a little spin on it, or he corrupts it, covers it over until whatever was healthy, kind of like a recipe, you start with, you say, oh, well, what is this made out of? Well, there's chicken in it, but then we've got (laughs) sauces and cheese and rice, and you think, well, somewhere in there, there's something healthy. You know, he takes something that's good and he piles all this stuff on top of it. Um, So, and you can see that the enemy of our soul is referred to in Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. So if we don't recognize that there really is an enemy of our soul, this concept of the Lord being our strong tower, our stronghold, "Ah, I don't need it, I'm just wandering through life. Well, no, there really is no neutral ground. You know, you're either moving closer to the Lord or you're pulling away. And that's one of, I think, one of the biggest lies, the enemy. And when when I say the enemy, I want to clarify this. A lot of times people think of this little red devil running around and he's tormenting each individual person. This is a, I believe there is an entity, the devil, but he's not omnipresent, he's not all-knowing, he's not like God, he wants to be, but he's not everywhere. So most of us in this world, it is not the devil himself, but there are minions that there's just like every kingdom, there's layers under that, and there is a communication system within that kingdom of darkness, that's what it's referred to in the Bible. So I believe that thought process can come down from this enemy of our soul, but it can be a spiritual stronghold of bitterness a spirit of bitterness, and there's multiples of those that can be speaking to you and putting thoughts that you think are your own, and that's what we'll come around to more so. But I wanted to clarify that, because sometimes we think the enemy, this little devil man, is running around talking to all of us. Yeah, no, he's an angel of light, and he's not everywhere. He is not like God. He does not have that power. Amen. He wants to look like he does, and he he is powerful because he was created with a lot of glorious powers, but he's a defeated foe. 
And that is the biggest thing he does not want us to know is he is right. a defeated foe. Okay, so here's a bunch of scriptures about God himself being our fortress, our stronghold, our strong tower. You could read the entire book of Psalms and you'd get a bunch of them, but here's a bunch in Psalms. Psalm 9, chapter, sorry, 9, verses 9 and 10. Psalm 59, all of chapter 59, there's several places in there. Psalm 18, 2. Psalm 43, 2. 62, 6. 27, 1. 46, 1 through 3. 91, verse 2. And there's even a 144, verse 2. There's more in Psalms, but that's a bunch in Psalms. Jeremiah 16, 19. Joel 3, 16. My favorite, Joel. You guys catch that, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Second Samuel 22, 2 and 3. And Nahum 1 and 7. And that is just a sampling of places, just in the Old Testament, referring to God as our stronghold, our strong tower. That's where we should be operating from. That's where we're victorious, where the weapons, which will come to 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians, hang on, I like to put things right. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, where it says the <laughs> weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty. That's where things work, and we begin to tear down the lies that we built our life on, and we begin to be living on the truth. Um, okay, so we said the enemy of our soul counterfeits, corrupts, and contradicts everything that God creates. So this is what I found. He starts with a question. He gets you to question the truth. And one of the reasons I think the enemy does this, again, remember, and this is that, the whole kingdom, and I'm going to just say the enemy, is because if you ask somebody a question, what normally happens? Real simple kind of a, the answer. The answer. Whether it's right or wrong doesn't matter. They have a conversation with you. So mm. he's tricky because he comes. He could just come in and say, bah, 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 speaking at you. But if he comes in with a question, and you notice he did this with Eve. Did God say you can't eat of any of the trees? She started out by defending God. She said, oh, no, no, we can eat from all the trees in the garden, just not that one. Well, he knew that. <laughs> he just wanted to get her in a conversation. Right. So he starts with the question of the truth. And it's not that we're afraid. A lot of times if you hear people that um, come against believers, they'll say, oh, you're closed-minded. You just don't want to hear other people's opinions. And I would say, well, if it's true, it's, it's in there. You know, if it's true, I'm not afraid of it. We can come and we can search that. Come, let us reason together is what God says. He's yeah. not afraid of questions right. at all. So it's not about the question. It's not that we're afraid. To, she didn't say, oh, I don't want to question God. She, he just tricked her into something that had nothing to do with the question. It had everything to do with getting Eve's attention and getting her to enter the conversation. I just saw something I've never seen before when yeah. you're sharing that is, he was getting her to connect with him. Wow. Because that word communication in the Webster's Dictionary means to connect. Wow. So, and they, I've read that when you want to get to know somebody, you know, you ask questions. Yeah. So, true. he was getting her to connect when she responded. Like a false intimacy. Almost yeah. like he was truly interested in her. Oh, is this yeah. what he said? And really, it was manipulative question. Right. It was just to get her into that. So notice that, that question. It's, it's, a di it's different than a true, genuine desire to know the truth. When we question to say, I want to know something true, very different than when it's just to twist you into a conversation. Next, he forms a lie. And that's the next thing he did with Eve. He got her in the conversation, and then he posed it. He said, well... Um, it's not so much that God doesn't want you. He's not protecting you from this tree. He actually doesn't want you to be like him. And he knows that the day you eat of that tree, you're going to be like him. The truth is they were already like him. <clears throat> he got them to think they didn't have something they already had. That's a huge lie. And, and she, all of a sudden, oh, I'll be like God? Not even realizing she already was. She had everything that she needed. And Adam did too. And he got her to believe she needed something she already had. And then got that lie in her mind to, to um, the question came in of God's integrity toward her. And when that little seed of doubt came in of who he is, he formed that lie. He then seasons the lie with reason and doubt. So the doubt about God's character and this reasoning, which is a false reasoning, that she went, oh, right, I'll be like God. That is a good thing. Yes, 
it is a good thing. And guess what? You already <laughs> have it. You don't need a vacuum when the vacuum salesman comes to your door and you have three in the closet just because this one, oh, it's going to help. And then you look around and say, wait, I have wood floors. I don't even need that dumb thing, you know, because it sucks up carpet. You know, it's better on carpet. So all these little lies, but he seasoned that lie with reason and doubt of God's character and, this, and a reasoning that didn't really make sense, but it, it appealed to what God put in us, which is mind, will, and emotions. Oh, right, right. And then he speaks as if it's true. Mm -hmm. And that's what really got her, is now what started, if he had just come right in with a lie and said to her, God doesn't love you, and he's trying to kill you, she would have said, uh, I know God. I walk with him every day in the garden. Get away from me. But he twisted it to where basically that's what he got Adam and Eve to believe because they hid when they realized they were naked, which, again, they already were naked before, but naked didn't seem bad to them. So the truth was they just realized a different emotion attached to something that was already good, and they hid from God, and that's, the, that's what Satan wants. He wants to pull us away from God instead of drawing near. And I don't know, this is my own doctrine thought, what would have happened in that moment if Adam and Eve, instead of hiding, had run to God and said, we've been deceived, we sinned, we ate of the tree, what should we do? And it's, I would imagine that Jesus would have, would have still had to die for their sins, but I don't know how that would have played out. You yeah. know, they hid and then came in blame, well, this woman that you gave me, he really was blaming God. This woman you gave me, and then she yeah. said, well, the serpent, this blame thing started. There's your first picture of what a stronghold is. He got them to believe this lie, and they began to operate from the lie instead of from the truth, and it became the reality. Yeah. I saw something else that I haven't seen And before. I love this, just so everyone knows, if you have anything to share, please, it's one of the greatest things about meeting yeah, together. Yeah, I know you want that, <laughs> so I feel free, but yes. um, when he, she, when he... The devil, or the enemy, said to Eve, all this stuff, and then she made the decision to choose to eat. I just saw, and this goes along with this too, with mm -hmm. the way of glory is, that was total independence on her part. Yeah. Because it's not about, it wasn't even about submission. There wasn't any such thing back then mm -hmm. yet, you know, with... Adam and Eve. Right, they were equal. But it was that they were a team. Adam was created, Eve was created out of Adam, mm -hmm. and they were a team. God made them a team. He made Eve to be with Adam. Mm -hmm. And so she acted independently without talking it over with Adam first and mm -hmm. saying, you know, look at this. Yeah. Should we do this? Mm -hmm. You know, we're a team. Should we do this? Yeah. But no, she acted independently. Mm -hmm. You know, she was thinking for herself. Yeah. And that's dangerous. Right. I mean, We're meant to be in relationship with each other. Right. That's why I love this group. Mm -hmm. Because we have that accountability with each other. Yeah. The openness and it brings uh, the a, transparency. Yeah. A full picture. Yeah. yeah. I love it. So I, I like that. You said yeah, something too that, that is really key in there. She chose. You know, he didn't hold her down and shove the fruit down her throat. Exactly. But he got her to a place where he would choose. And that's a good thing for us to realize. He, you know, we say, oh, the devil made me do it. You know, we jokingly, <laughs> that's the thing you hear in anywhere. But the truth is, he can't make you do anything. You're really untouchable. That's right. Um, when you're God's child, he, he can't touch you. But he can get you to think a certain way, which begins to get you to feel and act a certain way. So she made that choice. He influenced her. <laughs> But she listened and made the choice. So when we recognize, wait a minute, he can't make me, but he can deceive me to the point where then I will be so operating from that stronghold that it'll make sense and I'll choose to do it. And then I'll turn around and think, why did I do that? You know, we'll often say, I knew better than that. I've been down that road before. Why did I go back down it again? Um, and the greatest gift that I believe we have is the gift of repentance, that we can come to the Lord. And this is where I think the enemy is so angry. He doesn't have the same gift. He is not able to repent for his sin. He can't come and say, you know, I truly am sorry and I want to turn this over. And he's very angry. I don't know that he could even if he wanted to. I don't understand how that works to the point that his, his being was so corrupted in what he did. But we have that. And so what one of the gifts that we can have when we fall into that, if we've ever gone down that road a little ways, Wherever we recognize it and go, oh my gosh, I'm going down that path. 
We have that gift to stop right where we are. We don't have to repair all this. We stop, drop, and pray. <laughs> Remember when yeah. we were in school, we were, there was a fire, we were taught stop, drop, and roll. Stop, drop, and pray. And right in that moment, say, Lord, I've headed down the wrong path. And I repent. The word repent actually means turn and go the other way. You know, it's not just, a lot of times we go, I'm so sorry. And then we get up and we keep going, I'm so sorry. And we keep going. That's not repentance. A lot of people feel sorry for the things we've done, but we haven't actually repented and said, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to head the other way. And, and I know you're going to empower me to do that. Because when we do come to him in repentance, he pours out that grace on us, which is grace. We're going to come to that here in just a second. Grace is what empowers us to do that. Mercy is what forgives all those sins and then grace springboards us forward to have the power to do it. Don't you believe too that if you get so far you can go into bondage mm -hmm. and if you just feel like you can't yeah. make it, you can't, you repent and you try and it's not working then go and get somebody to pray for you. Yes. You know, for deliverance from the bondage that you've yeah. walked into and gotten so far that you feel like yeah. you can't get out of it. Because sometimes we hear a lot of people call it greasy grace, you know, where people say, oh, it doesn't matter how far you've gone. <laughs> God can always rescue you. There's there's a big truth in that. Yeah. But the, the underlying kind of lie that's there is that none of this matters. But if you recognize this whole walk, there's been bondages. So we can turn and go around, but as we walk back, we've got all these strongholds we've got to tear down. And exactly. he's going to teach us how to tear them down. Mm -hmm. But that's, it is a lot of work and it's exhausting. And I think that's so important to remember, don't do this battle alone. If you, especially if you know, you identify some strongholds in your life that are pretty big, that have been there from childhood even, to find someone that you can trust and say, I'm, I'm gonna need someone to walk through this. Like we say in Way to Glory, I didn't do it to you, I can't do it for you, but I'll walk through it with you. Exactly. And we do, we grab each other's hand and say, hey, you're gonna still have to tear that stronghold down but I'm gonna stand here with you and I'm gonna fire everything I have at it too, but you can't, you've gotta be right there with me. Right. Yeah, that's awesome. So you have to want it. Yeah, and do that work. Um, so we can either choose, like you said, to listen to the enemy, have that conversation, believe the lie, and then live and choose in accordance with the lie, so then we're being conformed to this world. And that word used in Romans, conform, is like put in a mold and smushed into shape. <laughs> Okay? Or the other word that's coming up, here's the other thing we can do. We can recognize the lie, turn away from it, not entertain the conversation, find the truth. And I really think speaking it out loud is really important because the enemy can't read your mind. The Lord can. You can have a conversation to the Lord silently. But if you want to rattle the kingdom of darkness, you say it. And I picture it as sound waves going out and woo, it rattles the kingdom of darkness, Ooh, like speaking that. the truth. Speak it out loud, and then we begin to live and choose in accordance with the truth, and we're transformed by it. So Romans, I think it's 12 too, is it says um, to present our bodies as living sacrifices, and it says do not be conformed, smushed into the mold of the world, but be transformed. That word is metamorpho. That's when a butterfly goes into a cocoon and comes out. So God's not trying to conform us to his ways and smush us. He's transforming us into what we really are. A butterfly really is a butterfly, but when it's still a caterpillar, it just hasn't been metamorphosed, transformed yet. It hasn't yet shown what it truly is. So when we are renewed by our mind, God is actually transforming us on the inside, and we burst out of that cocoon and become who we really are. Mm -hmm. He created that butterfly in there. But the world would come to us and say, I'm going to conform you and push you into a mold. And that's how strongholds change who you are and how you start functioning. Okay, are we ready to ask There's ourselves a lot of some that questions? Peer pressure. Yeah, so yeah. many places Pleasing that would be a people. good. That would be it's a really good thing to notice. Mm -hmm. The uh, acceptance of people. Yeah, that's a big one. There, we can make lots of lists, and there's some really good resources. I'll, I'll name it out. I, I really like Neil T. Anderson. He has a ton of books and, and ministries. Victory Over Darkness, um, Bondage Breaker, The Steps to Freedom in Christ, and his ministry, I think, is called Freedom in Christ Ministries. Um, really good information that's just very step-by-step -step and, and helps you to like do these inventories where you can go through and identify areas and then some prayers to pray through to help you get going because sometimes it can feel a bit overwhelming and you could get a trusted friend to go through that. I've gone through it and it's really good. Okay, are you all ready to ask yourself some questions? Yes. Okay. Let's close our eyes. I have to keep mine open because I read. But y'all close your eyes. And just right now in a moment, just ask the Holy Spirit in your heart 
to reveal some things to you. And this is something I'm going to encourage everyone to do this week when you have more time and get your journal out. But just right now, ask the Holy Spirit in your own mind, say, what am I most hungry for? These hungers often identify our areas of stronghold. So spirit, soul, and body. Just take a minute and think, what am I most hungry for? Where do I tend to hunger and in what ways do I meet that need with what I really need? In what ways do I attempt to meet that need with something else? Think on that for a minute. What are you really hungry for? In what ways do you meet it with what you really need? And in what ways do you attempt to meet it with something else? Now ask yourself, what do I really need? And ask right now, what is God putting his finger on for you right now? Is there something? And it was a real short little snippet, but if the Lord put a little finger, sometimes I've found in those short moments of prayer, it's like a little highlighter goes bing, and, or we feel that little pressure on an area of our life. If the Lord's done that, I, I encourage you this week to meditate on that thing and ask him to show you more. And then remember this, everything he does is motivated by his love. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he sent his son, not was so irritated with the world, so mad at the world, so frustrated, so fed up. God so loved us that he sent his only son. Awesome. Thank you, Lord. I'll can open your eyes. If the Lord put his finger on anything, if anybody wants to share anything, it's probably a pretty personal thing, but if there's something you want to share, feel free. Um, can you say that list of questions mm -hmm. again? What am I most hungry for? <clears throat> Excuse me. What am I most hungry for? And that's a good question to ask yourself in the moment. Because a lot of us, if we've had food issues, when you feel the munchies, and you say, stop, before I go, what am I hungry for right now? What am I truly hungry for? And think through spirit, soul, and body. And find out, is it really just a physiological hunger, like I actually need to eat something right now? Or am I hungry for something else? I'm, I'm tired, I'm lonely, I'm sad, um, I'm bored. What is it I'm hungry for? And then in what ways do you meet that need with what you really need? And in what ways do you meet it with something else? So in that example, if let's say you started to think that through and you said, um, boy, I'm really tired. And what I really, in what ways do I meet my need? I sit down and put my feet up. Or I went to bed because it's 12 o'clock at night. Or I took a nap. And in what ways do I attempt to meet it with something else? I'm really tired, so I went and got a third cup of coffee to keep myself going. Do I need coffee? No, I need rest, but I don't have time in my mind, so I'm going to drink this coffee. So maybe you had to. Maybe you're in the middle of the day and you have a meeting and you say, okay, my real need right now is I'm exhausted, but I have a meeting, so I'm going to have a cup of coffee. But I'm going to plan tonight when I was thinking about going out with my friends, I'm going to stay home tonight because I'm tired and I'm going to go to bed early and I'm going to take a bath and I'm going to put my feet up. So we can't always meet our real need right in the moment, but if we can become mindful of it and make a plan for it. And that's the, that next question, what do I really need? So when we, it kind of comes back around, what am I most hungry for? And as you ask those questions and you go, oh, what I really need is some rest. And then it's up to you to choose, am I going to care for myself and give myself the rest and find a time for it? Or am I going to be my enemy and say, no, you bad body, you keep going. And that's what many of us have done We've treated our body like it's a foe we have to fight instead of a friend. Those hungers are friends. Remember saying, hey, I'm, excuse me, but I'm really tired. <laughs> or I really need some fun. I'm bored. Whatever that might be. or some inter interesting conversation. Now, the second question was, in what ways do you meet that need? With what you really need. So that's the good one. In what ways are you actually meeting it with what you really need? And then in what ways that's are you... That's the second question? Mm -hmm. And I can shoot a with picture of it for you with, with what you really need. And then in what ways are you attempting to meet it with something else? Okay. And I'll give you those at the end when we come back around so you okay. can write them down. Um, and I think it's really, really, really important that we remember that everything God puts his finger on us, if he highlights something, the enemy would want you to feel shamed and get, oh, I'm condemned. The, enemy, the, the Lord never wants that. He, if he puts his finger on it, he's, he's going to empower you in it. And it's going to be motivated by his love. Never disdain. If we've had father issues, and we've all probably all talked, I know you and I have talked about this, if we have issues where we've grown up and never felt the approval of a father, 
oftentimes when the Holy Spirit puts his finger, we think, oh, I'm, a, I'm, not, we're, I'm not good. You don't love me. You don't accept me. Never. There's not one time that he looks at us with, with that kind of a disgust or disapproval. He, I always picture him smiling, and you've heard me say this. I love the book Heinz Feet on High Places because um, the yes. shepherd always he's always smiling when she'll do something and she's like I feel horrible and and while she's down in this little ball all you know whining he's just smiling or laughing like you are, and it's never condescending it's no. not like oh you you know he's just not like, laughing you are beautiful if you could only see who you really are yeah. but he sees her that way he's it's, taking delight in us de- yeah I love that he delights in us and that's yeah. why he laughs mm-hmm. um, all right Here's another couple things to picture what a stronghold is. You may have heard this before. There was, I don't remember where I've heard it, I've heard it a few different times, but they say that it's in whatever country where they trap monkeys, people that are like um, poachers trying to get monkeys for whatever, zoos or whatever, they take a coconut, yeah, yeah, exactly, (laughs) hollow out a coconut and put this meat in the bottom of the coconut that the monkeys really like, and they tie the coconut to a chain, and they'll put these out, and the monkeys stick their hands in, grab the meat, and they can't get their hand out. And all they do is pick up the chain and leave the monkeys away. Well, the truth is the chain is not on the monkey. He is totally free if he would let go of the meat. He can slide his hand out. Ah. But he's got a hold of that meat. He has a strong hold, and he's now a captive, and he can't get his hand. Oh, wow. What and he's picture. led away by these poachers. So <laughs> in what ways do we stick our hands in coconuts, grab onto something, and say, but I want it, I want it, I want it and we're being led away captive, where all we have to do, even though it feels like a lot, is drop that and whoosh, we're gone. The truth is we are free in Christ. We're already free, but we're hanging on to things with a stronghold that have chained us and made us captive to the enemy's kingdom. He has no legal right over us anymore. The only thing he can do is trick us into sticking our hands in coconuts and grabbing onto things that are good sometimes. A lot of times it's something good, but we're grabbing it with a stronghold, and it has become where we operate from. Where, where we start with Isaiah 55, if I'm going after my own provision, but I need that need, he says, no, you need me. I'll take care of all of your needs. Um, we can ask ourselves, what are we holding that's keeping us captive? Can we let go and be free? It seems so simple, but for that monkey, <laughs> it's a big decision, and we're going to be yelling, let go of the meat, monkey, run away. But for that moment, that's it's when we've all been there, like I can't, I can't, I can't. And that is what the feeling of a stronghold is. The truth is you're no, this fast thing. from free, but how do we drop the meat? <laughs> um, I, in doing this, picked up some of the last things we wrote in the blogs and I found this and I, instead of rewriting it, I'll just read it to you. This is something that was in one of our blogs the last time we went through the class. Um, the other way that hunger can be unhealthy, when we're talking about unhealthy hungers, is when we have a stronghold in one of our areas of hunger. The stronghold, this false mind frame, becomes a filter through which we see those true hungers, and thus they become corrupt and distorted. Just as we must work to identify our real needs, we must also work to identify strongholds, false beliefs and mind frames. So when that, those questions of finding out our real need, when we close our eyes there, it's also important that we do that to say, what am I hanging on to, and identify them. And then pull them down with our spiritual weapons, taking them captive to the obedience of Christ. And hear this, our greatest fear is that our needs really can't be met, that God is not sufficient to meet our needs. Mm. If that monkey knew that there was plenty of meat over here, it would be very easy for him to draw, I don't need that, and to run free. But if he can think, well, this is, this is it. Without this, I can't be okay. He's going to have a really hard time letting go. So in that, if we realize sometimes our greatest fear is that our, our needs really can't be met and that God is not sufficient to meet our needs, even if we don't think that. We've had a lot of Bible knowledge. God is sufficient. He's all-powerful. Do we really believe it? The truth is that God is sufficient to meet all of our needs. Every stronghold falls powerless when confronted with the truth of God's sufficiency in Christ. Isn't that awesome? That's how free we really are. So you might think of a stronghold as this. It's what you're trusting in. If you're trusting in something false, it becomes an idol that holds you down and keeps you captive. But if you're trusting in the truth, which is, I love that you said that, it's God himself. He holds us up and sets us free. 
totally different picture. Anything that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, which is a lie, can become a stronghold. So 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 is a scripture that says um, that we do not, even though we walk in the flesh, we do not do battle as those that are in the flesh. But our weapons are not carnal or fleshly. They are mighty, which that word is dunamis, which means dynamite, powerful, to the pulling down of strongholds. In that, we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So if you imagine those thoughts that are lies, like we talked about before, how the enemy comes in, that thing comes in, you take it captive like a monkey with the hand in the coconut and say, uh, hang on a minute, let's bring that into obedience to the truth. Like when you go to um, <clears throat> the airport, which moms had to do, and you come through and you show them your identification at the TSA, and then they take this little light and they scan it over your um, driver's license or whatever to make sure it's authentic. That's what we do. We take every thought, we stick it under the light, which is the word of God, and we say, is this authentic or not? Is this true or a lie? Right. Hold it up <laughs> to the light of God's word. Um, and that is that's how we can say take that thought captive and I jokingly once said to Joel a while ago when I was struggling more with like how do I not think these thoughts I said honey how do you do it he says you got to take every thought captive I said I can't catch them much less hold them captive yeah. <laughs> I said they're running around in there like crazy so when I started to realize what it is is recognizing what the lie is hold it up to the truth and and identify it to start out uh, we've pretty much said this everything is either drawing us closer to our creator or pulling us further away there truly is no neutral ground. Wow, that's that cool. is another one of the enemy's biggest lies, is to tell you that, oh, you're just fine right where you are. And he keeps us complacent. And you're not bad. You're not, you know, the best person. There's other people that are better than you, but you're, you just don't need to worry about it. You don't need to fix anything. You're just genuinely this happy thing and good and don't worry about anything. And your life goes on. But if we recognize that you're floating down a river, <laughs> There is no neutral ground. You're heading one way or the other. You're either paddling or floating or however you want to picture it. You might be sitting still on a, a raft, but the enemy says, see, you're just, you're fine. You don't need anything. You're just sitting there. Doesn't, you don't realize that you're traveling. And like mom said earlier, you're so far down that road that you haven't even seen it. It's a tricky, slippery slope. And this isn't a self-condemning thing. This is truth. If you had cancer, or any kind of disease, let's say you had a little skin cancer on your arm and you went in and the doctor said, we, we can take that off. Wouldn't you want to know? Rather than saying, you know, oh, well, I don't want anyone to tell me about that. There's a remedy for it. Yeah. So it's a blessing. It's not saying you're a terrible person because you have that on you. You should feel so ashamed. No, let me take care of that. And that is what we do with the Lord. He never condemns us, though the enemy will always, always tell you that God's going to condemn you. He'll always put that thought in your mind that you're going to feel ashamed if you bring your sin to the Lord and confess it. Whereas it's like we come and say, Lord, could you take care of this for me? He says, already done, paid for, boom, it's gone, taken care of. Never any shame. I picture this like, can we shock God with anything that we do? He goes, oh, what did you do? <laughs> I didn't see that coming. You know, he, nothing shocks him. That smile is on his face, and he says, I know. I've got you covered. Come to me. Come to me. I will. I'll walk you through this. You're never alone. Just come to me. You have a choice. You can walk away from me, but come to me. Why would you not want to come? And that's, again, the enemy wants to come in because he knows the only way he can keep you from well is to keep you away from the one who has everything you need. The minute we come to God, every need is met. So he can't fix he can't change that all he can do is keep you from coming make you feel shameful well, I don't want to I don't want to go to the Lord I'm this I'm that to keep you from coming to him and he also tries to keep you from ministering to others that way he'll say um, he said this to me this morning oh you can't minister joy and love to the lady that pumps your gas that is your friend because you haven't been performing up to par this weekend mm -hmm. You know, yeah. you haven't spent as much time with the Lord as mm -hmm. you usually do. And I'm like, you are such a liar. So let me oh, ask you a, a question for everybody. How, when those thoughts come, how do you immediately know or not whether that's the voice of truth or the voice of the enemy? Because it pushes you down and it tries to make you unhappy. Mm -hmm. It tries to make you hide what you really have. 
That's good. I knew that in an instant because I had the joy of the Lord. Yeah. You know, and I got went through a battle mm -hmm. this morning. Every morning, it's a battle. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm 73 years old, and it's all about my body. You know, trying to get me on that. Mm, you know, you're old. You're this. This aches. That feels bad. And I had to go through that battle this morning, and I went through it, and I, you know, got ready. <laughs> yeah. You can't go. You don't feel well enough. You can't drive all the way over there by yourself. You know, lies, yeah. lies, lies. Yeah. But you have to get through it, mm -hmm. you know, because you just woke up. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, You're not quite all there yet. <laughs> yes. And, uh, and then, you know, I just got in the car, and I just started praising the Lord, singing songs. And, and then the enemy says, you know, I was like, oh, I can't wait to see Brenda because I hadn't seen her for a while. Mm -hmm. She owns a gas station that I was talking at. And, uh, and then the devil said that, you know, mm -hmm. I can't show her the joy of the Lord because you haven't been spending time with the Lord mm -hmm. like you usually do this weekend. You've been too busy, yeah. you know, for the Lord. <laughs> and I had already said to the Lord all the way over there, Lord, I'm sorry. I, I really, really, really want to spend more time with you. Yeah. You know, I'm working on that. And he's like, it's okay. You know? <laughs> I know your heart. Yeah. yeah. He's yeah. like, I know you love me. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's really good. I so. often will picture, if I have a thought, like, could I picture God saying it to me? Like, so he's saying, you can't show the joy. Oh, wait a minute. He would never say that. So it's exactly. got to be coming from somewhere else. Exactly. You know? When he says something to correct us, he might say something like, you know, I have something else for you, something that might be a little better. Maybe you can make a different choice. There's a different, totally different feeling when he brings something totally. to our attention. Even when he corrects you, because mm -hmm. he said something corrective to me the other night at a meeting, and it was really firm and, and like a father, mm -hmm. you know. And I hadn't heard the voice of the Lord like that in a long time. I mean, the Lord gives me downloads, as yeah. he does everybody during the day, but... This was the voice of the Lord in my spirit, and it was like, well, and, but it was so cool because it was like, I didn't feel bad. I didn't feel, I just felt like. Yeah, no condemnation. Here's the road, walk on it. Yeah. I love you. Mm -hmm. Here's the road, walk on it. Yeah, like our talk about boundaries. He's saying, yeah, hey, I'm, exactly. showing, I'm showing you how to not fall off. Yeah. I'm not trying to control you or manipulate you. I'm just saying, hey, you're getting a little close to the edge. I would suggest you. Exactly. Well, it was, I was just going to say, it was like he was saying, don't make this mistake. Mm, that's so yeah. good. It yeah. was. It was Motivated really by his love. Yeah. So good. Um, I like this. So this helps me. Remember, there's nothing between us on God's side of the equation of our relationship with him. He took care of all the sin that separates us through his son, Yeshua the Messiah. Death, burial, resurrection. We can now boldly come into his presence as far as he is concerned. So Hebrews 4.16 says that we can now come boldly before the throne of grace to receive mercy and grace to help in a time of need. So he's already provided that. And I like to picture like a bank account, okay? If we were in the negative, which is what says we had a debt of sin we couldn't pay, his mercy is what brought us to zero. His mercy, which came through Jesus, death, burial, resurrection. Jesus said to tell us die, which is that financial word, paid in full. He paid it off and brought us to zero, but he didn't leave us at a zero balance. He says he gave us grace to empower us to walk out the salvation. We still didn't earn his grace. You can't work hard enough to get it, but the way you work it out is because he's poured a positive account. He says, I brought you, I, I canceled your debt, and I put a deposit in your account. Now, Ooh. what are you going to do with it? Hallelujah. Are you going to just sit there and say, oh, I don't need to be any, do good because my father put an inheritance in my account. Or am I going to say, thank you for putting this in there. I'm going to do something good with this. That's that parable of the talents. When yeah. the master left, and he gave each one according to their abilities, and he came back, and two of them had doubled it. And one said, well, I, I didn't spend any of it. I knew you were going to call it to account, so I buried it, and here you go. He says, why didn't you even invest it at all? You know, you just let it sit there. We're to take that investment of grace and work out our salvation. We don't work for our salvation. It was that gift of mercy and grace. But we've been given what we need. So if we ever feel like, I can't, I'm not strong enough. No, you're not. You've already, But your father put his inheritance in your account. It's in there. Yeah, Withdraw wow, from that great. grace and walk forward in it. There's a couple scriptures that you can look at for that. If you want to write these down, Philippians 2, 
12 through 13, and 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and 10, that just talk about uh, grace not being in vain. He, they're talking about it being a positive thing. It's not something that's for nothing. It's something that's for something. So mercy, here's another definition. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. So if you deserved a penalty, that'd be like if you committed a crime and you're in, in the court and, and someone said, I'm going to have mercy on you. you. You deserve to go to jail for that, but we're going to have mercy on you. Grace is a gift. It's getting something you don't deserve. It's something positive. It's not because you did something bad and you're not being punished. It's saying, you know, you didn't work for this, but I'm going to uh, give you $100 just because I really love you and I want you to go treat yourself to something. There's the difference of, of mercy and grace. So if there's nothing between us on God's side of the equation because he's taking care of that and he's given us that grace and mercy that we need, anything that's between us, anything is on our side of the equation. Like an example would be unforgiveness. Uh, in Matthew 5, 23, and then a little bit later, Matthew 6, 15, he talks about forgiveness. He says, if you're at the altar offering a gift, and there you realize that you, your brother has something against you, leave your gift there. First go and be reconciled to your brother, and then come back. And then later, uh, next chapter says, because if you don't forgive from your heart, neither does your father. And it's not a punishment, like, well, if you don't forgive, I'm not forgiving you. He's basically saying there will be something between us. If you don't forgive, this unforgiveness will grow bitterness and we'll have something between us. And I've already taken care of that. But you're going to put something between us and I won't be able to reach you with my forgiveness. Right. But if you'll put that away, I've already given you my forgiveness. It's not a punishment. And that's where we, we sometimes read scripture. Oh, if I don't forgive, God's telling me, well, now I'm not going to forgive you. He's saying I can't because you've placed something in between us. Right. That's a stronghold. That's what we're tearing down. So he already did his part. He forgave our sins and gave us his grace to empower us to do our part. So what is our part? And we're wrapping it up with this. I, there's a whole bunch of R words. <laughs> but they're great. R E words. What is our part? Rejoice. Repent. Receive. And rest. Mm -hmm. Rejoice. Repent. Receive. And rest. You okay, buddy? We want to first rejoice in that he's given us everything we need. Then we take that gift of repentance and coming to him and saying, I have a need. I have sinned. I need what you have for me. Now I receive it. And now I rest in that. And the enemy comes into all those, no, you are this. Yes. Yes, I am. I'm forgiven in Christ. I'm a new creature. If we don't know God's word, I have four pages on my refrigerator of who I am in Christ. So I can read that and say, wait. I'm a child of God. The enemy can't touch me. I no, I no longer walk after the flesh, but I walk after the spirit. This is who I am. I'm transformed. I'm no longer conformed. I'm transformed. Um, so we take every thought to the obedience, every thought captive to the obedience. That's that like TSA, or every thought will take us captive. So we're really there's that neutral ground doesn't yeah. exist. If we don't take those thought cap those thoughts captive to the obedience and get rid of the ones that are lies and replace them with truth, then those things will take us captive. We'll be monkeys with coconuts on our hands. <laughs> so we have one choice or the other. Take the thought captive or the ca thought will take you captive. I love that scripture. Whose report will you believe? Isaiah 53, 1 says, we will believe the report of the Lord. What does God say about you? If you're struggling with your own self-image or other people's opinions of you, like you were saying, man's approval, wait, what does God say of me? I am loved. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. He delights over me. He has given me everything I need for life and godliness. So here's the last little list of things. How do we demolish strongholds? Number one, hold it up to the light. Picture that going through the TSA. Hold it up to the light. Is it true? That's what you have to first start with. How do you know if something's true? It's where we started. Come and see. If we're not in the word of God, this is what he gave us to know what truth is. We won't know. We won't know what truth is. Hold it up to the light. Is it true? That's the number one question. Then two, recognize and renounce the lie. So you've held it up. Is it true? Then recognize. Here comes your more R words. Renounce it. You say, oh, wait a minute. That's a lie. Okay? Let's say the lie is if I'm thinking I'm, uh, the truth is I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Oh, I'm flawed. So I recognize it. Wait a minute. I'm not a flawed person. I renounce that lie. And then revoke your consent with it. 
recognize where you've believed it. Say, oh, I've given consent to the thought that I'm not, I'm not good enough. I'm not well made. So I revoke my consent. And I say it out loud. Whenever a thought comes to me, I, I, I think, oh, I, my this, I'm just not good enough at that. I can't, I can't speak with that thing. I say, wait, I revoke my consent to that lie that I believed in. Oh, good. I like and that. now I replace it with the truth. Lately, that's been my one. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Mm -hmm. Fearfully and wonderfully made. I was, I was made with a purpose, and I speak that one out loud. Then repeat it, repeat it, repeat it <laughs> right. out loud because it's true. Think about the word brainwash. We tend to use it as a negative, like, oh, you've been brainwashed. Well, wait, wouldn't it be good if your brain was dirty? <laughs> yeah. Don't you want your brain to be washed with the water of the word? So if you have all this corruption, yes, it's not a brainwashing to make you a robot. To, to believe a lie, it's to cleanse out what's wrong. So when we repeat something that's true, we're washing away the dirt so we can walk in truth. And then the last thing, and this is probably one of the most important things because this is where the attack often comes in, stand your ground. Mm -hmm. uh, Ephesians says that in chapter six, having done all to stand, stand. Remain in the truth. John chapter 15, write that one down and read it this week. That's about when Jesus says, um, my father is the vine. I'm the vine. You're the branches. My father is the vine dresser. If you will remain in me and my words will remain in you, you will basically, you'll flourish, you'll flourish, you'll thrive. This is, this is how we remain alive. That whole chapter is abide. phenomenal. If you will abide, yeah, that, the Priscilla Shire would yeah. do. If you will abide in me, make your home. Psalm 91, those who have made God their habitation. He has all these promises for us. Um, so remember this expect for this new healthy stronghold the good stronghold that you're functioning from of truth expect it to be attacked if we don't expect the lie to come it is usually when it blindfolds us expect it to come because when you're in that neutral ground or you've been deceived into thinking you're in a neutral ground you're usually kind of left alone those thoughts kind of my oh everything is good and we're in this little bit of a blissful place where we start to say wait a minute i'm floating down a river of lies and we put our feet in the, down the bottom of the, and we stop that flow or we start paddling the other way, that all of a sudden we feel the current. When you're floating, you don't feel it. But when you stop it and you say, wait a minute, all of a sudden you feel that pressure and we start walking in the truth, it will become easier. But if we don't maintain the ground that he's given us by abiding in the vine, abiding in the truth, for me, the two most important practices that I've found are prayer and his word. Sitting in his presence, um, I love, there's a scripture, it's in Ephesians um, 6, be strong in the Lord, I think it's 6.1, and the word actually means be strengthened by, so it's not telling you, mm. come on, be strong, it says be strengthened oh, by him. Good. I picture myself as a cell phone plugging in. Uh, my battery is low, so I sometimes will just sit there and I imagine that I literally have plugged myself into the Lord, and I'm just allowing his Holy Spirit to charge me up, and I just put out if I'm worrying about anything, I just say, Lord, strengthen me right now. And then often I'll hear either a word or he'll say, why don't you pick that up and read it? And I'll just open and start reading. Or often I'll just sit there and let him love on me for 20, 30 minutes. And just, that's prayer. We were talking about what is prayer. I'm not just shouting out a list of yeah. things or, or going through it. I'm just oh, saying, that's so good. Be Lord, align me with you. Isn't that cool? Because it's true. Yeah. You know, you just get in his presence and let him charge you. That's it. <laughs> yeah. You're strong again. Yep. And can you see how important all this stuff is? And whatever our battle is, you know, this group we're talking about health, wellness, and optimal weight. Uh, any struggle that we go through, it, these these hungers and this stronghold are so important because you can do all the work to to kind of fix symptoms, patch things up. But if we don't get to the root of it, we're not going to truly be well people. So, does anyone else have anything to comment, add, share, say before we say goodbye to our friends on the other end of the? Good? Yeah, good, good. Go ahead, Mom. Okay, I have something to share. Yes. I just want to kind of minister for a minute, if that's okay. Yeah, do you mind if I turn this? Oh, uh, yeah, it's okay. Okay. Um, like, oopsies. Hang on. <laughs> Everybody okay over there? <laughs> we dropped you. There we go. Yes, um, a minister that we heard last August, Carol Elaine, the Lord was dealing with her to get on, you know, Facebook like Stacy's doing and everything. And she doesn't like it, and who does, really? You know, knowing that all these people are looking at you. <laughs> but the Lord spoke to her and said, get over yourself. <laughs> get over yourself and start ministering to people on, you know, 
the internet. So that's what she's doing. That's what so I'm going to do it. Awesome. <laughs> I'm getting over myself. But I felt led to say that I, we want, my husband and I watched Sid Roth, It's Supernatural. Just to nutshell it, this woman started praying, create in me a clean heart, O Lord, and renew a right spirit within me. And I believe it's Psalm 91. Is that right? I think it's um, Psalm 51. Yeah. 51, I'm sorry. 51. Anyway, you can look it up if you want. But if you start praying that, she had the most miraculous thing happen. God came to her in the middle of the night, woke her up, picked her up, put her head on his chest, and he deposited into her heart healing in areas that she didn't have any feelings anymore. And I'm sure all of us can relate to this. I know I did. Is there's areas of your heart that you, you just don't have those feelings that you had before. And so he, she, the Lord took her heart and he made those areas whole and she was a completely different person and God healed her heart in the areas where she needed it. And she started to feel again in these areas. And so I just wanted to encourage, because I believe this goes along with strongholds, is if our heart is healed, if we have a clean heart and a right spirit, then God can really minister to us and break these strongholds. We can work together because it's a covenant with our Lord. It takes two for a covenant. Like they say, it takes two to tango. And I think it takes two to break a stronghold. Like Stacey's been saying, we have to agree with the Word of God and we have to agree with the Lord and what He wants to do in our lives. So I just wanted to encourage you on that. And I also want to pray a prayer if that's okay. Yeah, and I'll just put it real quick. It is Psalm 51. Yes, and okay. that'd be a great one to pray. It is Psalm 51. And um, I'm, I'm, I've already started praying it. Well, the other thing I wanted to say, we were watching another Sid Roth program, and um, it was about breakthrough. And I just felt impressed as I was sitting here and Stacy was wrapping it up. I want to pray a breakthrough prayer because I think a lot of us need breakthrough in a lot of different areas, and not just the food area. There are strongholds in other areas too, finances and so forth, healing and relationships. So I just want to pray today because he gave us keys for praying on this show and he prayed breakthrough for us and I already had a couple of breakthroughs that day, the next day. So Lord yes. God, we just thank you so much that we're not alone in this world. We're not alone seeing all these horrible things that we're seeing on the news and hearing things that are happening even close to home. Lord, all these pestilences, diseases, attacks of different kinds. And we just pray and thank you so much, Lord, that we can look to you for help in these dark days. Lord, these days are bright as well because you're there. You're here. Your light is shining in the darkness. The darker it gets, the brighter it's going to shine. And we're the ones that you've called to shine it. So, Lord, I pray you give us the power, the strength, the, the desire, the passion to show your light to this dark world. And we pray in the name of Jesus that souls will be saved through the light that they see in our lives. And, Lord God, we just pray for breakthrough for everybody that's watching today and everybody that's here. Woo! We just thank you, Lord, for a breakthrough anointing. Breakthrough. There's gonna, look for it. I just want to add, we are not just going to expect that the enemy is going to come, but we're going to expect miracles. Yes. Lord, when we pray, we believe. We have to believe when we pray that we're going to see miracles, and we do. Yes. We testify to that today. We speak it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I pray and I believe that we're going to hear miracles. Yes. We're going to have miracles in our own lives, things that we aren't even aware of sometimes. You're going to reach down into our hearts and you're going to break all these strongholds. Lord, thank you for breakthrough. Mm -hmm. Breaker, breaker in Isaiah. Jesus is breaker, breaker. He's going to break through for us. Right. In Jesus' name. Yes, and I want to add, just feel really impressed to pray that anyone anyone listening, anyone of us here, that anyone that um, does not have the Holy Spirit living within them right now who has not completely surrendered 
their heart to the Lord right now. We just recognize that until we come to you first in yes. salvation and receive this great gift that you yes. are offering us, not because we deserved it, not because we did anything to earn it, but simply because you love us that much that you gave your son to die on a cross, to go in the ground for three days and to be raised and to leave all our sin in the pit of hell, never to be seen again. We rejoice in that and we yes. recognize what you have given to us. And I would just pray right now that any person that has not received salvation right now would just receive the gift of yes. salvation and yes. say, Lord, I need you. I need that gift. I have sinned. I have fallen short of the glory of God as all people have. I am not an exception to the rule one way or the other. I am not too bad to be saved and I'm not too good to not need you. I need you. And I receive you right now and rejoice in the gift of salvation. And that transforming that you've promised us would begin to happen and would continue to happen in those that know you and those that receive you this day would begin to feel the presence of your Holy Spirit dwelling inside of them and transforming them to become that beautiful butterfly that you already see, you created them to be, yes. that they would become that. In the name of Jesus, our Messiah, amen. Amen. <laughs> Bye, everybody. We love you all. We can't wait to see you throughout the week and beyond. Oops.